your Friday daily delivery. I am Michael Rand. Glad to be back for another day. Hope you guys are having a great day out there. It's always a great day when there's a Game 7 on the horizon, and there is one in Wolves versus Nuggets. Going back to Denver after the Wolves completely obliterated Denver. 115-70. to 70. It doesn't even sound real. 115-70 to 70 on Thursday night couple days off now before the fi- the final game of that series in Denver. I'll talk a lot about that here in just a minute. Um, plenty of other good stuff on the show. Kent Youngblood from the Star Tribune joins me here in just a little bit to talk Lynx, talk WNBA. Lynx have their home opener. They take target center, um, center stage today, tonight against Seattle. They already won their opener of the season in Seattle a few nights ago. Um, kind of a new look Lynx team. Kent and I will get into that. We'll get into the WNBA as a whole, which is seeing a surge in business, um, seeing a surge in popularity, Kate, the Caitlin Clark effect, although Clark struggling early on, maybe not a surprise, but struggling early on, the number one overall pick, Indiana 0-2 on the season. They got blown out last night. Clark struggled. Um, she, had, she had 20 points in her first game, but 10 turnovers last night didn't shoot very well. Held to just nine points, so a little bit of an adjustment for Caitlin Clark. But again, not completely unexpected given how good this league is. Uh, but yeah, Kent and I will get into all that here in just a little bit. Got to talk twins. Uh, Patrick Royce did a great column just detailing their offensive futility against the Yankees. 26 consecutive scoreless innings, 378 pitches without a run. Um, and getting swept at Target Field by the Yankees. Three beautiful days for baseball, but not beautiful baseball by any stretch of the imagination for the Twins. And we'll get to PWHL Minnesota, which has a deciding game tonight as well. It's a Game 5, not a Game 7, but um, those deciding games are just as important. First, though, what did I miss? Like I said, we're going to talk a lot of Wolves at the jump here. Just because that's what it, that's what is warranted right now. Everybody in a great mood right now. And listen, NBA, you know, this is kind of a cliche, but longtime basketball writers, especially NBA writers, will like to say that the NBA basketball is a game of runs. We we joke about that on you know in the media on press row and we're covering games things like things like that we'll say game of runs if a team is kind of you know if it's if it's a back and forth game it's just kind of like something we say to kind of note what kind of game it is i turned the game on i wasn't there last night i turned the game on i had a big we had a big uh festival celebration at one of my kids schools so we were at that walked home from that got home i turned the game on it had just started denver was up nine to two game of runs right denver starts the game on a 9-2 run, actually 9-0 after the Wolves scored the first bucket. So Denver starts the game on a 9-2 run. And you're thinking, okay, here we go again. That was my sentiment. Here we go again. This is not going to go great. Um, Wolves had already lost three games in a row. And this was this was going to be it, right? This was going to be the end because um, the momentum was just gone. Denver had figured this thing out. And away we go with it. So I was like, okay. But then Jaden McDaniels hits a corner three, important shot. He looked like he kind of hesitated on it a little bit, but he took it, kind of rattled in, you know, just wasn't pure swish, but it went down nine to five. Next thing you know, um, the Wolves finished the game on a 113 to 61 run, 113 to 61. And joking aside, um, you know, their run was like 20 to nothing after that. After that 9-2 to start, they got contributions up and down the lineup. They figured out their energy. They fed off of it, and away they went. Jaden McDaniels started it. He was great during the run. He was great during the whole game. Anthony Edwards was terrific. Mike Conley Jr. coming back from his injury, his calf-slash-Achilles injury. He was fantastic in this game, giving them that kind of steadying influence. Carl Anthony Towns didn't have a great offensive performance, but he was very good defending Nikola Jokic, and he made the right plays primarily, stayed under control. Rudy Gobert was good. Nas Reed hit some shots. Um, Kyle Anderson had some moments, especially when things were kind of stagnating a little bit. Um, you know, Nikhil Alexander Walker, they emptied the bench with like eight minutes left in the game. That's how lopsided this thing was. The lead got to 50 at one point. Um, they finished up with a 45 point win. Not something I think 
any of us saw coming. But then again, this is the nature of this series, right? It is completely unpredictable. You would not have guessed that the Wolves would win the first two games in Denver, um, especially the second one, which is a 26-point blowout. You would have not have predicted then that Denver would come back to Minnesota, win the next two, including a blowout in Game 3 by 27 points. Um, you might have guessed that Denver was going to win Game 5 based on that momentum back in Denver. That was maybe the only predictable game in this series, but it's been a weird weird series right like it's it's going to a game seven and i'll get to more of the history of that in a minute but it's going to a game seven without there being a real classic in this series game one was probably the best most competitive game in this series it was pretty close most of the way um it was virtually tied with like five minutes left but the wolves kind of pulled away from there and the closeout of the game was relatively routine there was no drama there was no last second shots there was no last second stops that just kind of like cruised it into a seven point win from there but that was definitely the best game of the series because after that you had the blowout for the wolves in game two you had the blowout for denver in game three you know game four was relatively competitive but denver kind of put that thing out of reach um, for all intents and purposes with that bizarre stretch at the end of the first half where they turned that seven point lead into a 15 point lead when the Wolves just couldn't get out of their own way and then you know Wolves would make little mini runs but then Jokic always had answers for that same with game five they just, Denver just kind of kept the Wolves at arm's length and then of course last night another blowout this one of epic proportions you know one of the biggest blowouts in the playoffs one of the biggest blowouts in an elimination game in NBA history so there hasn't been like that classic like nail biter kind of game and I have no idea if we're going to get that in game seven I would imagine you would get both teams best effort which you haven't gotten in every case this year uh, this series obviously with half of the games being blowouts you know you, you see you see both of these teams have had their struggles to maintain energy to maintain focus to maintain composure um so you i have no idea that's kind of the the theme here i have no idea what to expect in game 7 um what i do know is this uh they are going into this game with the possibility of advancing they are going into this game with a distinct possibility if they win of having home court advantage in the next round because Dallas now up 3-2 on Oklahoma City Dallas the five seed they beat the Clippers the four seed in the first round and now they have Oklahoma City on the ropes although that series as we know far from over Oklahoma City could certainly win game six and game seven they were the number one seed younger team maybe it take them a little bit longer but Dallas has the chance to get through that so the Wolves have a chance here if they can win game seven on Sunday a big if a big ask again especially since we don't know what's going to happen we can't predict this series but I would give them a pretty decent chance in that next series if they can get through this even if it's Oklahoma City I'd like them in either of those series obviously Dallas would bring Kyrie they'd bring you know Luca all that stuff um Oklahoma City a little bit more well-rounded and of course they have SGA who's been tremendous this year but getting ahead of ourselves but just saying the opportunity is there right the opportunity is there what we don't know is how they're going to look they're such an energy team they are such a flow team and Denver has been that way too in these playoffs and especially in this series so we'll I think we'll know relatively early uh, maybe not at 9-2 because we didn't know at 9-2 in game six how this thing was going to go but we'll know relatively early what kind of game we are in store for I would guess it's going to be somewhat more of a back and forth close game hard to imagine one team just gets its doors blown off in a game seven but you never know. I mean, both of these teams have had their spirits broken at individual moments in this series. And if one thing is snowballing on Sunday, you could imagine that. Now, we won't know game time until we find out the result of Knicks Pacers. Could be an afternoon game Sunday. Could be a night game, depending on the outcome of Knicks Pacers game six. So that will have an impact on your viewing. But Wolves have only played in one Game seven in their playoff history, of course, that was Wolves versus Kings back in 2004. Interesting bit of history. This game seven in Denver will fall on the exact 20-year anniversary 
of that Game 7 against the Kings also was in the Western Conference semifinals, was at Target Center, not on the road. So the Wolves did have the home court advantage in that game. KG's birthday, it was KG's 28th birthday on that game night, um, which means this is his 48th birthday on Game 7 on Sunday. A little bit of Wolves history there. Speaking to that game a little bit, I was there for the game 20 years ago. I was helping cover it with the Star Tribune, doing sidebars, additional coverage, things like that. Tremendous game. But that was the game. The Wolves won 83-80. to That was the old NBA, 83-80. to Although, hey, you know, maybe Denver would love to score 83 based on how they've gone, uh, how they went on, uh, on Thursday night. But um, 83-80 was the final. That was the game to me that turned Kevin Garnett from a star or a superstar into a Minnesota icon that, that cemented his place a little higher echelon in Minnesota sports history because a lot of the KG narrative early in his career was he didn't get it done in the clutch. And if you remember, they had lost seven straight first round series before that, starting in 1996 through 2002. So the 96-97 season through the 2002-2003 season. They had lost seven straight first round series. Hadn't even gotten things to a game seven. I mean, they, a lot of those were game fives back in the day before they switched that up. They had made it to one game five in a best of, uh, in a best of five early on against Seattle. Um, that's how long ago that was. But Wolves got to that game seven and KG that year had elevated his game. He'd become more of a clutch performer. And in that game goes for 32 points, 21 rebounds, five blocks, four steals, a couple of assists, plays 46 of the 48 minutes. The Wolves win 83-80 when Chris Webber's last second three goes in and out. Looked like it was in. Um, I was there. It looked like it was going to go down. It did not go down. Wolves win. Jubilation. KG jumps up onto the scorer's table. There's a classic picture where Sid Hartman is in the background, kind of like st- like standing back, like, what's happening here? KG on the scorer's table, going bonkers. And then, of course, Sam Cassell gets injured against, you know, before the Lakers series. They, you know, he plays a little bit in that series, but they end up losing in six. Don't make it to the finals. That was their last great team before this season. So what does this mean? This means Ant has a chance to elevate himself here. He's already elevating himself to new heights. He was really good again last night, under control, good energy. Um, He has the right mindset to be great in this Game 7. In fact, I want to play a little clip of him from Thursday when he was asked about the opportunity to play a Game 7 Sunday in Denver. Like you said, they're the defending champs, Um, so it's going to be super tough. They're home. They're they're at the crib. They fans is crazy. It's going to be super loud, but, I mean, I feel like as a competitor, it's like one of the best feelings in the world. I've never played a game seven on the road, but all my playoff experiences on the road has been like super fun because nobody's on your side. So I can just imagine how this game will be and like the fans. So I'm super pumped for it. So you know Ant wants this, but he's only 22, right? He's only 22. KG was 28. KG was stepping into his kind of mental and physical peak at that moment. That was probably that was his MVP year. That was probably as good as Kevin Garnett was ever going to be when you combine how he could play physically with what he knew of the game already. He'd already been in the league like 10 years at that point because he came in, of course, straight from high school. Um, Ant is in a different spot, right? Ant is in a different place in his career, but he does have that kind of it factor. So he can elevate his stature. This is where you do that. This is where you do that in Game 7s. I think he is ready for the moment, but that doesn't guarantee how he will perform. What he does in this game will tell us something about where he is right now. I won't necessarily tell us like what where he's ever going to get to, but it'll tell us a lot about where he is, about where this team is right in this moment. So the opportunity here should not be um, taken lightly, should not be, you know, over understated this is an opportunity right now to win a game seven to get to the conference finals to take that step to feel like hey you win this game you've got a good chance to go to the finals you might be 
on a championship path. That's what's at stake here, and that is what he is feeling right now as a 22-year-old who is the unquestioned face and star of this team. So how he responds in that moment, how the Wolves can get him loose from all that Denver defense, from all those double teams that Denver's been throwing his way, especially in Denver, especially in Game 5, how they respond to that. We will learn a lot about that. And again, this is a series hard to predict. I have no idea what to expect on Sunday. I expect, you know, the, the thing that you should probably expect based on what you know of these teams, even with the way the series has gone, is that you will get their best effort, but you never know. We don't know what we, the only thing we know is that we all get to watch one more game of this series and at least one more game of this Timberwolves season. Happy to talk Lynx basketball, WNBA, with Kent Youngblood from the Star Tribune. Nobody covers the Lynx or the league better than Kent from, from my perspective and hopefully yours too. Kent, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I am good. Um, really good opener for the Lynx. They win on the road Tuesday against Seattle. Final score, I think, 83-70 really turned it on in the second half. Couldn't have asked for a much better debut from their new players who really keyed that win. Home opener Friday again against Seattle. Um what what do you what do we take away from the first game and then also kind of bigger picture kind of what 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 do we expect to see from a team that's kind of remade itself not just with new players but a little bit of a new identity. Yeah. Um well, it's interesting the the opener uh, in Seattle was between two teams that had radically different lineups than a year ago. Yeah. They both made very significant off-season moves. And uh, and so you, you never know exactly what you're going to get with that. And I thought that, at least in the opener, and we'll find out more tomorrow if that cares over, the Lynx had developed a chemistry with its new players more quickly than the Storm had. Yeah, I think that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think that um, I think that uh, the combination of Bagumake, Jewel Lloyd, uh, I mean, they're going to be good. Yeah, but the Lynx got to that kind of comfortability level more quickly. And I'm 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 not exactly sure why. I think the fact that Williams and Smith played together in Chicago last year probably had something to do with it. I think that um I think Collier is like the ideal star to build around because she's kind of generous in both basketball and non basketball ways. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Whereas, you know, Lloyd, I don't know anything about her as a person. I mean, but she's a volume scorer. She's yeah. a volunteer. And when you add a couple of big name players, it's Skylar Smith, uh, Smith or Degan Smith and, uh, and Agumake. That's, that's going to affect kind of for dynamic on that team. So I think it just took them a little longer. Um, plus there was some, I mean, Smith had a career day. Uh, Williams, I think had 14 points, seven assists, five rebounds and five steals. Yeah. Uh, Hyman came off the bench for a, she had a bunch of assists and um, a bunch of steals. So, I mean, it couldn't have gone better for the new people that they brought on. You wrote before the season started that they're maybe trying to change their identity a bit and kind of build around defense a little bit similar to, um, you know, maybe not to transition too much to NBA talk, but kind of, you know, the Wolves definitely have built their reputation and success this year around defense. How How do you see that? playing out are do they have the pieces to do that uh quickly well it's not so much deciding to build an identity on defense to get back to a defensive identity because got it for all the star power they had in the in the championship runs it was always defense especially when fouls got here yes they were they were a top four defensive team i think every year but one between 2011 and 2019. So last year was a kind of outlier, and they were horrible. They were 10th in the league in defensive efficiency. They were just not very good. And so I think that a lot of what they did in the offseason was built to, to to address that. They got a kind of a rim protector in, in 
in Smith, who I think had four blocks the other night. Uh, and they got two guards who can defend on the perimeter. And when you can defend on ball on the perimeter, <laughs> that makes a lot of things a lot easier. They weren't very good at that last year. What do you think Cheryl Reeve, you know, head of basketball operations, personnel boss, has learned in that role over the years to help Cheryl Reeve head coach? Like how, how have she kind of set herself up to win with the kind of players that she wants, you know, as opposed to how they maybe have been forced to build rosters in the past, in the past like four or five years. I I think that, um, I think that there was a, as they were kind of trying to, to to transition from the fouls era to, I guess the collar area. era. Um, I think that she got caught a little bit in talent, valuing talent over personality and who they were bringing in. I think there were you, you know, I don't want to rip anybody in particular, but I think they made some moves to bring in people who could play, but weren't good teammates and weren't good mixes with what the culture is here. And I think that lesson hit her hard. I don't know if she would talk about this, but I think that she decided that in order to be a successful team over the long term, you've got to bring in people who fit the culture as well as can play on the court. Um, And I think they've done that with this group. Um, Heidemann and... Williams and Smith all seem to kind of fit in well. I think they're all pretty good teammates. And you, you got to have a kind of, I mean, not just connectivity, connectivity, but you kind of have to have a faith in your teammates to play great defense. Yes. And I think that they, I think they have the potential to have that. Well, and that was like the, you know, not unsaid, but maybe underappreciated part of their dynasty. They had four Hall of Famers for a good stretch of that, who also fit the culture, right? Like who not just who weren't just great players, who basically defined that culture and enabled them to be, you know, that seven year run when they won four titles, lost in the finals twice, went to the conference or you know the semifinals, conference finals the other year, mm-hmm. like that. You know that run like doesn't happen probably if you have one or the other. You got to have you do have to have both at a certain point, but maybe valuing one over the other as you're building is more important. Well, you know, it's a, it was a little different team then. It was a little different league then, too. Yes. Uh, but, you know, they didn't really ascend to the level of a championship team until Simone Augustus, who had been a career volume shooter her whole life, sat down with Reeve and agreed to play defense. She became their best perimeter defender. Yeah. And then you had Brunson, who is one of the greatest po- denial post defenders that I've ever covered. So, I mean, you have to have a willingness to do that. And they, they did it a little differently than I think this one will, but you got to have a, a willingness to, to defend. And, you know, it's amazing how many pro basketball players, both men and women don't have that. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's, there's a selflessness to defense that maybe doesn't come as easily when you've been a star all your life. And all these players in the league were, you know, have been stars at pretty much every level, at least until they get here. And then some of them are still stars, but not everybody can be a star. So that, that makes sense. You, yeah. you mentioned how the league used to be. You wrote in the lead up to the opener the other day about kind of where this league is going. Just, you know, business is booming, ticket sales up everywhere. Some of it, maybe, you know, to varying degrees, we can discuss how much of it, is the impact of this rookie class, the Caitlin Clark effect. Some people also would say, hey, this has been happening for a while. This is just kind of extra, you know, additional kind of jet fuel that's taking it to another level. Um, but, you know, expansion, it, it's happening. They're going to go to 14 teams, it sounds like. And, you know, TV deals, the charter flight thing, like this, the, the level of this league, they seem to be leveling up at a very fast pace right now. Yeah, it, it's, you know how... Um... The idea of kind of critical mass is like you build and build and build and all of a sudden it just kind of takes off. A tipping point, yeah. But it's you know what's interesting is, you know, and I joke I joke with um Reeve about this, is that there's this whole group of people, both fans and media, 
who are, are just like woke up and just said, hey, there's a there's a woman's league. You know, like like when the Clark thing was was building to you know in, insanity levels and she declared for the draft and she's drafted. I mean, how many times did you read like analysts who've been covering basketball years saying they don't charter? What the hell's with that? <laughs> right, right. Or, or this is Clark's rookie salary. What's with that? You know, it's, right. it's like, there's right. a whole group of people who never realized anything about the league who are now opining on it. And I find that somewhat amusing. It is. But, it, know, is. it is. It, uh, as, as Reese said, there was a wave. Now it's a tsunami. Right. Um, Lynx ticket sales are up 50%. Which is, cr- I mean, they which is. Top, they were already a top four league attendance. Yeah. Um, two point three million at his peak. Watched Clark commit ten turnovers in her WNBA yeah. debut. I think it was like two hundred thousand viewers per turnover. So <laughs> yes, uh, I, and I'll and be. He, ca- she yo, got go also two quick fouls, and she went and tried that kind of complaining thing she did in college. It didn't really work that well, though. So she played again Thursday. This is before we re- or after we recorded. Um, maybe. Um, so we'll save kind of the commentary on her second effort. We had 20 points, 10 turnovers, the, the uh, double, double, the hard way, not the double double you want, but undeniable her impact just in terms of eyeballs. Like you said, over 2 million viewers, um, the links are opening up the upper part of target center for the two Indiana games here later this, you know, later this summer. And, you know, the league, the league feeling the the impact of that, these other rookies, but also just, you're right, the, the building that has been happening already. And I wonder if there's some kind of push-pull between the people who have been, you know, driving this thing for 10, 20 years, like a Cheryl Reeve, and then the kind of like the new guard coming in and how much credit they want to give to this influx versus the groundwork that's been laid. Well, you know, it's interesting, um, like, you know, the links, I mean, the prices that the links are going to get for tickets, you know, they didn't schedule the Maya Moore retirement on the day Clark was here for no reason. That's not a coincidence. No. But, I mean, uh, Washington's moving games with Indiana to the back to the bigger arena. Las Vegas is moving to a bigger arena for those games. I mean, Los Angeles is doing it. Yeah, I, I saw mean, that. It's... Uh, I, I think that I think that when when the Lynx finished up in Seattle the other night and were able to bus to the airport and get on a charter plane and fly home rather than getting up at six the next morning and trying to get home over a six hour stretch, mm-hmm. we're like, yeah, we're okay with we're okay with <laughs> <laughs> right, Cause, you know. Because that's yeah. not that's not cheap. It was like twenty five million over the first two years of it. Yeah, and you know, and I, 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 I think I kind of I, I during pre um, season um, Zoom calls with league players. I, I think um, Brianna Stewart was asked, you know, in kind of veiled language. I mean, are you resentful of this? And she's like, No, we're you know, we got to stick together. Anybody who brings interest this interest in this league is going to help us all eventually. So why would anybody be resentful? Now, having said that, you don't think that everybody who's matching up against a Caitlin Clark or Angel Reese this year wants to come out and, and oh and, yeah and play? Of course, you know a well, certain, you got you know, to earn it, right? They want them to earn it. They want to see, okay, you were great in college. Can you, you know, and we know you're a great player, but you got to earn it here. This is another level. That's what it is. I don't know if you saw the comments by Asia Wilson about Caitlin Clark. I don't think I saw those. I saw a lot of the Tarasi stuff early, but yeah. Well, it's just suggesting that a lot of Clark's popularity is is a white black thing. Interesting. Yeah. And you know, she got she came in the league, hadn't done anything, and got this massive Nike deal. Now, interestingly enough, very shortly after the world was <laughs> got, voting. Got her. Yes. This, she got her own Nike. Got her deal. own shoe, yeah. Didn't she get her own shoe? Yeah. Um, um, so I mean, I think that if you're a, a player, a coach, an executive, a fan of this league, anything that makes it more popular is a good thing. Yeah. They want to celebrate her, but they also want to 
Yeah. They want to, they want to, I mean, I think that, I mean, well, but look at the, look at the NBA side of it. How often does a top five pick in the NBA come out and just start dominating from the start? I mean, it's, even yeah. Anthony, even Ant was a, an okay player, but wasn't some kind right. of dominant player early on. Right. It's, so to assume that, that they were going to, you know, that Clark was going to come in and, you know, score 35 with, you know, 15 assists on our first game is probably kind of silly. Right. She'd be a great player. I mean, she's undeniably talented and can shoot and pass. And just, but that doesn't mean her rookie season is not going to have some challenges. No. And her, and the people who, defend her no matter what will have their oh well she had the turnovers because um her teammates aren't ready for her passes yet she's just on another level like there, there is a level of people who it's kind of like the it's almost like a taylor swift fandom where they can do no wrong even if you even if you don't really like one of taylor swift's songs you can't really say it because yeah. you know, so yeah. even even if even if uh even if Caitlin Clark has an off game or a bad night. You got to explain it away with something else, but she's undeniably great for kind of boosting the league. And I'll be interested to see how she, how she plays. Royal credit union, smart checking accounts offer no monthly fees and no minimum balance. Enjoy financial freedom. When you open your Royal credit union, smart checking account online at rcu.org slash go checking insured by NCUA. Let's let's maybe end with this. Circle back to the links because because of course they have their home opener Friday. The national profile isn't very high right now. I'm sure you know that's been the case for some of these years, and they've maybe exceeded some of those national expectations. I mean, should this be at least, at least be a a playoff team in a league that you know where eight of the twelve teams still make it? Absolutely. Um, you know, we have. I mean, I know that the league is expanding. For sure, one team and reportedly two in the next couple of years. But still, when you consider that there's probably only 140 jobs in this league, and how many, you know, and it's a worldwide, yeah, you know, now pool to draw from. It is, it is a very difficult league to 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 stick. I mean, it's like speaking of what we were talking about earlier about how people have kind of just realized that, that there's a WNBA. I read a story out of LA that was like, how could LA wave its third round draft pick? Well, that always happens. Always. That always happens. That always happens. In this league, there isn't 15 roster spots to develop. And if you're not a top 10 pick, there's no guarantees you'll even make a roster. Right. Um, and so, but, and, 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 and the talent level of the league has risen to the point where there are so many really good players. And there are a lot of good teams. So it's much more difficult to be a top four team yeah. now than it was 10 years ago. Sure. Uh, having said that, I think that if the Lynx can stay healthy, mm -hmm. especially in the backcourt, yep. uh, and its bench is more productive than last year, and that means Bridget Carlton hitting more threes and Zandalasini being what they hope she is, she kind of struggled a little bit in the opener. I think that, if, you know, I think that finishing on the top four is not outside of the realm of possibility. I think the yeah. goal would be to be a, a host, a, a, a home advantage team in the first round. Okay. That seems fair. You um, know, like, we have to, I mean, if Fee stays healthy and takes another step. Yeah. I mean, she was a she was fourth in the league in scoring and yeah. MVP voting last year. I mean, yeah. he's a legitimate if she doesn't get the press because she's maybe not as flashy or as showy or as demonstrative in many ways, she's a very, in her own way, kind of low key, but she's a superstar in this league. Yes. And any team that has one, you know, Olympic level superstar, if they surround it with competent people who stay healthy, I think can expect to be a playoff team. Expansion is. San Francisco and Toronto, reportedly, is that what we're thinking? Yeah, San Francisco, I think for, for sure, sure, right? Already uh, hired a GM, and I think they they're going to call themselves the Valkyrie. Really, we used to have a Valkyrie here in Minnesota. I can't remember yeah, what league that was, but and Toronto reportedly in 2026. Okay, those are two good markets. That's a good good place to so be. You're going to have 14 teams. Yeah, and I think with the that. 
the next thing will be try to grow rosters a little bit. Um, but if you have a rosters that are a little bigger and charter travel, that gives you a, and that means you could up the number of games per season very yeah. easily without okay. putting any more strain on, on players. Sure. Um, it's kind of hard to have a 40 game season in an Olympic year flying commercial, but if yes. you have flexibility roster wise, if you're, I mean, then back to back still becomes so killer, especially if they're within the same time zone because you finish the game, you get on a plane and you're in the town that night. That's, yeah. That's a good point. It's a good point. Um, All of this kind of, yeah, feeds into each they'll, other. They'll grow, they'll grow the league to 16 uh, or not 16, the 214. And uh, they'll probably, with the next CBA, up the number of games. I think that at some point, a 45, 50 game season will not yeah. be out of the question. You know? I think they'll stay with eight playoff teams. It feels like that would be. That would, it's a good number. A smart thing to do. Yeah. Because right now, it's, it's a. You see how the. New teams, how they kind of structure the the entry draft or the expansion draft. <laughs> they still set it up so that these teams can be competitive right away, or if they're going to be doormats to start. But it'll be interesting. Maybe I mean here's I just had a thought. Maybe when they go to fourteen, you could do a play in because the NBA loves that play in. You could do a seven through ten play in now and then. That's true. Um, you know they 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 had the kind of traditional one eight two seven deal for years, and then they try to come up with that rigmarole that with the double of, buys and the, yeah. the buys and the single eliminations and yeah, that was basically just for TV and right players were not interested in that. <laughs> no, but, um, yeah. There's no there's no need for a single elimination type of situation if the league is. Reaching the popularity it is I nobody agree. wants to see that they want to see. No. Yeah, I you agree. Know, the is maybe at some point the finals becomes a true seven game. It's never. Yeah, been. that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Um, do they have a good? Do you have an idea what kind of crowd they'll get for the opener Friday? I bet it'll be pennish. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think they averaged about seven last year, so. Okay. If they- Fifty percent sales that'd be in the tennis ten plus range. Okay, I'll be interested to see that. I'll be interested to see what the season holds for them. Kind of a year of a uh, year of growth. They would probably hope, kind of establishing an identity, building around Collier, and kind of going from there. Um, Kent, appreciate it as always. Uh, follow Kent Youngblood's coverage, Star Tribune, and StarTribune.com from Friday's game and everything else. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. All right, thank you. Great stuff from Kent. We'll see how the Lynx fare in Friday's home opener against Seattle. Already won the opener, like I said, um, Tuesday in Seattle. All the newcomers looking good in that game for the Lynx. We'll see what kind of season they can have. As far as newcomers go, there's none bigger than Caitlin Clark in the league. Like I said, she struggled in Indiana's home opener. They lost 102 66 to the New York Liberty. Liberty going to be one of the best teams in the league. Again, this year, Brianna Stewart had 31 points, 10 rebounds, four assists, three steals, uh, two blocks. She dominated that game. Caitlin Clark, um, nine points, seven rebounds, six assists, five fouls, three turnovers, shot just one of seven from three, two of eight overall, made all of her free throws. But it is an adjustment. This is an adjustment period for the rookie she is learning just game two for her but if you expected her to come into the league and just start putting up 30 point games like ken said that's not necessarily how it works this is an adjustment she's got some things obviously to figure out and um you know she's playing on a team that had the number one overall pick for a reason they were not a good team last season they've got some growing to do as well let's finish with the cooler and two things in their twins like I said at the jump, dominated by the Yankees. Uh, they had been twins had been so good, seventeen and three in their previous twenty games. Then they only score one run this whole series. No runs in the last twenty six innings of this series after starting the starting the series with a with a Ryan Jeffers home run in the first inning of the first game. Just 
dominated by the Yankees. Again, nothing new over the last two decades, but new from what we'd seen for the last few weeks from this team. And I mean, oh, Patrick Royce wrote about this team and kind of what is the real identity? What is the real twins? Hoping for their sake, for the sake of this summer, that it was more that this is more of an example of just a bad series. But you've kind of got two defined blocks of the year: the 20 games that started it when they couldn't hit and they were seven and 13; the next 20 games when they could hit and they were 17 and three. Now you started this third 20-game uh, segment and they can't hit again. So, what is the real identity of this team? Was this just a blip, or should we be concerned? That um, you know that the 20 games where they could hit was the outlier. That's what I will be watching as we go forward. Also in the cooler, PWHL Minnesota has a chance to advance tonight. Their season was on the brink. They were down 2-0 in the playoffs. Won their last two, including Wednesday, one nothing in double overtime. Game five tonight in Toronto. Home team has won all four games of this series. Minnesota hoping that changes. Um, right, trying to get a road win in a closeout um, do or die game, just like the Wolves will be on Sunday. So we will be watching to see what PWHL Minnesota does tonight as well. That will do it for me today. Be watching to see when that Wolves game is this weekend. Plenty coming up next week, of course, regardless of that outcome. Royce on Monday. We'll see if Game 7 warrants a special episode, especially if it's an afternoon game. We'll see about that. But until then, I am Michael Rand. Have a great rest of your Friday. Back at it again in a couple days.